Welcome to the speaker series. I'm Meg Garlinghouse, and I lead our social impact work here at LinkedIn. And huge warm welcome to people both in the audience and on the stream. Hello to the streamers. So we are in for a real treat today. Um, we have Jen Dolsky, who is the head of communities and groups at Facebook. And she is actually the most purposeful person I've ever met in my life. And of course, she's going to be here talking about purpose, which is perfect. Um, but really quickly, a few things about our speaker series. Our speaker series programs brings inspiring ideas at innovative thinkers to LinkedIn to help employees and members be more productive and successful. You can always go to speakers.linkedin.com to see some of our past amazing speakers if you're interested. In. So a little bit about Jen. Of course, you can find more information about her on her LinkedIn profile. Um, she's a LinkedIn influencer, which is good to know. I think one of the earliest LinkedIn influencers. But I've known Jen for more than 15 years. She and I were in kindergarten together. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> she and I were at Yahoo together. Um, she actually founded the Yahoo Employee Foundation, which has become kind of a model for other um, foundations in the corporate world. Um, but she um, went on to uh, have a huge role and influence at Yahoo. She actually ran one of Yahoo's six business units. Um, she also founded a nonprofit. Um, this was before Yahoo. But after Yahoo, she went on to create um, a company called DealMap, which famously became the first company that was sold to Google by a female CEO, which is both incredible and tragic, as Jen pointed out to me, to be the only female to sell a company to Google. But I'm sure that's going to change in the future. Um, so she, she's amazing. As I mentioned, she is the most purposeful person I've ever met, and she is here today to tell us how each of us can bring purpose and movements to our life. So with that, I will welcome Jen to the stage. Um, so Jen. We have a tradition at LinkedIn that we ask people um, at New Hire Orientation to share with us something that's not on their LinkedIn profile. So what is something that's not on your profile and maybe even not in your book? Yeah, there's probably a lot of things. Um, so when I think about LinkedIn, I think about jobs. So one of the jobs that is not on my profile, um, does anybody know what dendochronology is? This is the most Wait, bizarre a job. Snicker over is here. What? Dendochronology. No, with a D. <laughs> this is uh, archaeological dating. Who, who said it? Tree rings. Yes. Archaeological dating using the measurement of tree rings. When, when I was in college, there was a professor that I was super scared of. He was like really intimidating. He was the kind of person who used to give back people's like tests in order of how poorly you had done. <laughs> like, you know? And I was like, oh my god, I really have to work hard to impress this guy. And I wrote this crazy paper. And in the end, apparently it worked so well that he asked me to work in his lab, even though I was a psych psychology major. And he said, why don't you work in my lab, which did a Gian Dendo chronology. So I spent two years in a lab measuring tree rings in a microscope like this. <laughs> One at a t one ring at a time, like millimeters at a time, for two years. So there's got to be that's... some sort of uh, like rings, groups. There's got to be something there. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Like that. That experience led you to where you are today. Well, that experience did lead to something else. So it's it's interesting. All these experiences in our lives do add up to something. And as it turned out, he was a great mentor for me in a lot of ways. And one of the things that he did, he was on the volunteer fire department in the, the town where this university was. And he encouraged me to also join the volunteer fire department, which I did. And that was like a very life-changing experience for me, trying to do something that I was super scared of. Wow. Um, is that on your profile? No, that's also not on my LinkedIn profile. The funny thing about that story actually is <clears throat> they had to order special boots for me because there weren't any small enough in my size. And when you are a firefighter, you have to do this thing called the leg lock when you're on a ladder, where you lock your legs so you don't fall off. And my boots would always fall off. Like I would move and my boot would stay there. So I had to get special small boots. All right, we'll, we'll return to the, the actual book now. And we do this is actually a good lead question into the book. So we um, at LinkedIn recently did a brand campaign where we asked um, our members and employees what they're in it for. So what, what drives them at work? What's their purpose? 
how would you describe, what are you in it for? I am in it to persuade everybody that they have the power to start their own movement for whatever they care about. Excellent. Um, well, with that, let me go to the actual official questions for today. And by the way, we are going to open this up for questions around like 135, 140. So as you hear things, then you have a question, be, keep, it, keep those in mind. Um, so I know you talk about this in the book, but I think it might be interesting to hear a bit more about what inspired you to write this book and, and, and why now. Yeah, so I feel really fortunate because I've been able to have this career that gives me a kind of front row seat to watching regular people do amazing things all the time. And it started very early in my career. As you mentioned, I ran a nonprofit. Um, it was about helping kids be the first in their families to go to college. And so I saw these kids who were so motivated and working so hard and literally like changing the whole trajectory of their families' lives and often their communities. And then uh, through my career in tech, and it, you didn't mention it, but I spent the past four and a half years as president and COO at change.org. And so literally like every day, regular people would start these amazing campaigns for change. And then I see it now in my job at Facebook with, again, regular people who start communities who, you know, who inspire and bring people together for that sense of belonging. And it felt like I was getting this front row seat to all their lessons and the things that they had learned, and that if I could just share those lessons with more people, that more of us would be convinced we could do it, and that would lead to more movements that change the world. And books take a long time to write, so I have uh, been working on this book for a few years, and uh, the world has changed a lot in the past couple of years. So it does feel perhaps more important than ever that people are convinced that they can drive change. Yeah, and it's, it was almost like your oppression because as we were talking in the green room, it's amazing how many movements, even the last six months, have started, which is incredibly inspiring. Um, so talk a bit, oh, by the way, I did forget to mention in the intro that she was president of change.org. It's a pretty important piece of her bio, um, which has obviously informed everything she's doing now, both at Facebook and, of course, with this book. Um, but tell us, one of the central themes in the book, and this is the subti subtitle of the book, is tell us a bit more about what you mean, the difference between a manager and the movement maker, and why does that matter? Yeah, so first of all, I want to say I don't mean by that that managers are bad. Like, managers are great, they are important, they help people grow careers, they help companies um, exist and build things and so forth. The point I'm trying to make here is that while managers are kind of do the best with what they're given, they focus on goals they're given, et cetera, movement starters are the ones who don't accept the status quo. They want to push the world further than it exists today. And that may be you know, in your workplace, it may be in the, you know, your community, or it may be the world at large. But movement starters, it's kind of like if managers say, we're doing everything we can, movement starters are the ones who say, there must be more that we can do. Um, on the there must be more that we can do um, idea. There are so the the book is so great, you guys. By the way, I was telling Jen I don't have time to write book, to read books anymore in my life, and this book is exceptional. Um, and there there's a, and there's stories peppered out throughout, which makes it extremely readable and extremely um, mostly inspiring. Some of the stories are so heart wrenching; they're a little bit hard. But what what was one of, uh, one or two of your favorite people that you met, um, and, and what were some of uh, uh, for the one or two, what was the, the surprise about their story that left an impression on you? Yeah, this question is quite difficult, actually, because each one of the stories is so amazing. And they really range in size and shape. You know, there's a young woman with Down syndrome who was able to help persuade Congress to, um, to launch the biggest law benefiting Americans with disabilities since the 1980s. There's, you know, an entrepreneur who's rethinking all of personal nutrition. And, you know, so they really range. It's hard to pick a favorite. What I will say is that I interviewed people, sometimes in person, oftentimes on the phone, and I would leave these calls with just so much inspiration because I asked them about the steps they went through, and I ended up crafting these steps into the chapters of the book. And the way that it happened is sort of each story had a central lesson. And so each of those lessons are in the book. And um, one example that I might share 
um, is a woman named uh, Kara Golden, who is the founder of Hint Water. How many of you drink Hint Water? Or do you have it here at LinkedIn or no? Oh. That's, that's a side story. We actually, okay, we, sorry, we, I don't want to get into it's, 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 a, it's a little controversial because Hint Water, we all, I love Hint Water. Reed Hoffman loves Hint Water. <laughs> so a few of us um, made the case to try and bring Hint. We, we don't have bottled water. Oh, I see. In. Okay. So somehow Hint Water got classified as bottled water. Anyway. I understand yeah. that. And I do, I mean, having worked at Change, I am highly sensitive yeah. to these kinds of things. Um, but I will say Kara's story is really amazing because she started with this personal story. She had had three kids, she was a tech exec, she was having trouble losing weight and feeling not very healthy. She started looking into it. It turns out she was drinking a lot of diet soda. And so she said, what, you know, I, if I dropped diet soda, she, which she did, and started drinking water instead, and she lost all this weight and felt much better, but she didn't really like water. And so she wanted water with a flavor in it. And she just went to a bunch of stores, like looking for the flavored water. And all she could find was vitamin water, which has more sugar than soda. And so she said, I, I'm going to do this myself. But she faced so many critics and so many obstacles. And this is what, you know, the, the lesson I pull from Kara into Purposeful is prove your critics wrong. Because, you know, she talked to the person at Whole Foods and he said, sure, like if you make this, yeah, we'll put it on the shelves, you know, tell me when you do that. And he was just completely skeptical that she could ever do it. And then she had an exec from a big beverage company who told her, you know, sweetie, like people don't like sweet, you know, people like sweet, they're never gonna like this. And, you know, obstacle after obstacle, she kept going. And Hint has turned into such a movement now that it's not only this big water brand, which is, you know, $100 million, which is helping a lot of people be healthier, but now she's making sunscreen. I don't know if anyone's no. seen this. Like, she didn't start a beverage company she started a movement about our health, and she realized that sunscreen had a lot of bad ingredients, so she said, I'm gonna make sunscreen too, and I'm gonna flavor it with the same scents that are, we're flavoring the water. And now you can find Hint sunscreen in Target. It just went into CVS this week. Um, and so her story was one that, of many that inspired me. Um, the other thing that struck me about these stories is, um, I mean, literally, there is a story in there from every, gender, age, demographic, geographic, like in some ways there is no common thread about like who is a movement maker. And that left such an impression on me because I'm guessing that many of you in the room are like me and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not a movement maker. I'm not one of those. I'm not Kara, I'm not Mary, I'm not Megan. So talk more about that. Like what, what was it? What is there, did you find one personality attribute, one gene? No. This is the point. <laughs> this is the main message of the book is that we can all do this. And it literally is children, there are grandparents, as you say, there's people from every religion, every country, every race and age. Um, one of the stories that I tell at the very beginning of the book is a woman named Manal Rostam. She was uh, on a, she's from Egypt, she was on a bus trip with her cousin and they were having fun, they switched seats. Five minutes after they switched seats, the bus got in a horrible accident, rolled over three times, and her cousin, with whom she had just switched seats, died on the bus. And she lived, and she said, you know, what do I do? This shook her to her core, and she is a Muslim woman, and she hadn't been very religious up to that point, but she decided then to start wearing the hijab, the Muslim head covering, and she wore it for many years, and then she found years later that she started facing more discrimination, and. She saw women all around her taking off their hijab and thinking, what can I do? It's, you know, it's just me. She's, she was a young woman in her 20s at the time. So she started a Facebook group called Surviving Hijab. And she just invited 50 of her friends. And then over the next you know, days, months, et cetera, it grew. This group of women is now more than half a million women who are there sharing with each other about this experience, supporting each other. And then she realized once she had this big community that she could do more with it. And she herself is an athlete, she loves to run, and she would have trouble because there isn't really any gear made for hijabi athletes. And so, you know, she's just a regular person, a regular person who started this group. And she wrote a letter, an email to Nike saying, hey, why, don't, why isn't there any athletic gear for Muslim women who wear this. And 
they ended up writing back to her. It was just one tiny action she took, one email to one person. And that ended up leading to discussions. And now Nike launched, uh, at the beginning of this year, Nike Pro Hijab, which is a full line of athletic gear for Muslim women. And you know, she's just a regular person. But she says she has this great quote about, I, I wasn't a dead fish. I, th I saw myself, and I, I thought, if I do nothing here, I'm just a dead fish. And I didn't want to be a dead fish, so I did something about it. That's, yeah, that is an amazing story. I think we actually, um, some of us saw that ad when we were um, in the Middle East recently. It's an extraordinary yeah. Nike campaign, too. Um, so talk more about um, how important community is to these movements, um, particularly now that you have this incredible role at Facebook and maybe even from your change.org days. Like, how much does that matter? And what are the new ways in this new world that we're living in that community can engage? Yeah, so... I talk about movements a little bit like starting a standing ovation. You know, all movements are started either by individuals or small groups of people. They're not started by organizations. And being a movement starter is like being the first person to stand up and clap in an audience. Has anyone here ever started a standing ovation? Like been the first person? Well, I see one, too, some very shy people raising small hands. Okay, a few people. And it is, it takes bravery to like be the first one and say, I really like this thing and woohoo. But it's not a movement or a standing ovation if you're the only one clapping. But right, um, that said, like of the people here who've started a standing ovation, were any of you the only one? Like, does that ever happen? That only one person stands up and nobody else? Very rarely. And so the key to movements is community, right? It's like being the first one to stand up and clap and then pulling those other next few supporters to stand up with you. And there's a great TED talk on this by an entrepreneur named Derek Sivers who plays this video in the background of a guy dancing outdoors at a concert. Have you guys, and, has anyone seen that? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Have seen yeah. It? It's like this guy just yeah. out there, no shirt, <laughs> really, just really dancing like crazy yeah. at the concert. And he's by himself for quite a while. <laughs> and then eventually, one other guy stands up and starts dancing with him. And it's like how you approach that first follower or those first, those second few people who join you that makes all the difference. So instead of just continuing his own dance, he grabs hands with the other guy, he twirls him around, he's like really welcoming his followers, and then a few more people, a few more people, and suddenly like the entire crowd is up there dancing. And so community is like that. And we sometimes refer to great community leaders as people who are, it's like they're hosting a party. It's, you know, when you start a movement or start a community, you have to invite people in, you take their coat, you introduce them to each other, you start conversations. That's what makes them work. And there's a lot of stories in the book about um, how people get those first few followers. And sometimes it's easy. People just join you right away because you have this clear vision and really inspiring story. But sometimes it's hard. And there are, there's a story about Megan Grassel, who we talked about. She's a teenage girl. She took her sister, her younger 13-year-old sister, bra shopping. And all she could find were these super like sexy push-up bras. And she said, like, how can this be right for my 13-year-old sister, that this is all that's available? And so she decided to start a company, which she now calls Yellowberry, um, to create non-sexualized bras for teen and tween girls. And she made a lot of mistakes at the beginning. She tells a story about how she she picked her first fabrics that she ordered online by the color, and it turns out she ordered all sailboat material, <laughs> which doesn't make a good bra, by the way. Um, and then she started a Kickstarter campaign, and she tried to raise $25,000, and from her you know, friends and family, she had only raised 200. And she said she was so embarrassed, like all her friends at school could see this, because she's only a teenager. And instead of just stopping there, she went out and said, who else can help me? And she cold, like emailed and messaged 200 people who write blogs and have groups and so forth. And one out of 200 responded. And that person was the, the woman who runs A Mighty Girl, which is a blog in a Facebook community. And she posted about Megan's campaign, and the next day it had $25,000 raised. 
So like just a little bit more determination and a little bit more courage to reach out and ask for help, that's what can help. Start story. There's another story that I remember of a vision of a man standing alone in Istanbul, right. Istanbul Square or something. Yeah, Taksim Square in Istanbul. Basically, the, the point here is just that sometimes people don't get started because they think that they have to do something enormous from the beginning. Like you have to be Nelson Mandela or Gloria Steinem to like, you know, from day one. And that really isn't how it works. It starts with people taking pretty small actions. And yeah, there's a story about um, during a lot of the kind of violence and upheaval in Turkey, one man uh, went into the middle of Taksim Square, which if you've ever been to Istanbul, is a kind of a big square in the middle of the city. And he just, there had been some violence there in the previous weeks, and he just stood still in this square where the violence had taken place. And he stood by himself for several hours, not moving, not doing anything. And so it was, it was such a small action, almost a non-action. And then slowly people started to come stand with him. And then they started to stand in other places where, they, where violence had occurred. And soon it was all over Turkey, people just standing still as part of this movement. It's amazing. Um, an analog to standing alone is also um, when you do start a movement, you're pretty vulnerable to criticism. And I think you call them the haters or the trolls. Yeah. Um, so what, what are, what's your advice on how to address that? Yeah, so as I said, the, the book goes through a, a set of um, steps that I've seen all movement starters do when they're successful. And again, there's no um, like type of person that's successful, but there are a set of steps and skills that I think are critical. Uh, and later in the book, there's a chapter called Don't Drink the Haterade about like the more <laughs> successful you get, the more likely it is that you will face criticism. And especially today when you put yourself out in public, we all know and we see it on our platforms that it can subject you to criticism. And so there's a number of, of tips there about this, a few that I think are worth mentioning. Um, one is to think about criticism in two buckets. So I talk to a lot of people who've been highly exposed to kind of uh, feedback and, and hate. And what they say is that it helps them to separate feedback about the things that are outside of their control. So things like your gender, your race, your appearance, where people are commenting on things that you A, can't change, and B, don't have anything to do with what you're actually doing. And then the second bucket is feedback about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that bucket of feedback can also come in nice ways and in less than nice ways. But if we separate it to say, OK, this is feedback about what I'm doing and can be open-minded to thinking about how it might help us, then it can actually have value. And there's a quote that I love uh, from Ken Blanchard, who's a great leadership um, writer and guru, and he says, even the best athletes in the world have coaches, right? So like the idea is all of us can benefit. And I, I think about the athletes that like when I grew up in San Francisco, so I was a 49er fan. I had like Joe Montana posters on my wall. And, wow, um, new fact about Jendles. And Steve Young. I was kind of in the split era when they transitioned. Um, but yeah, they have coaches. And it doesn't mean that their coach throws a better touchdown than they do. Or like Serena Williams' coach has a better serve than she does. But they have something to teach them. And so there's a lot that can be taken from criticism, even when it's not nicely presented. And there's a story about a woman named Mary Lou Jepsen, who has led big tech teams at both Google and, and Facebook. But before that, she started an organization called One Laptop Per Child. Mm. And this was the idea was to build solar powered, super inexpensive, light readable laptops for children in the developing world. And there was a ton of interest in this product, but everybody told her it just was not possible. And so what she did was say, like, how do I use this criticism to my advantage? And she did what I call leveraging the naysayers. So she went and met with a bunch of executives at one of the large tech companies in Asia. And they said, she did her pitch, and they said to her, there are 23 reasons why this won't work. <laughs> and she, instead of getting discouraged by that, she just said, well, OK, I've been taking notes, and 
I have 17 of these things solved. How about I go back, try to solve the other ones, and then come back to you and see if you have any more you know, problems. And that's what she did. And they basically helped her debug her own product for free because she was willing to take their criticism and not get discouraged. And so I think there's just a lot of ways for us to handle feedback, and there's a bunch more tips about that. In there. Yeah, that that's an incredible uh, le, le, lemon, the lemonade story. Um, you know, Jeff, when he was uh, previewing this talk last week, gave you huge props as being one of the uh, most extraordinary leader managers that he's ever worked with. And I know you have some of this in your book, some tips and tricks, because of course at some point in a movement, it's you're not alone, you actually have a team you're managing. Can you talk about some of either your, your personal um, philosophy around leadership or things that you sure. do in the book? And I will say, you know, it was very much a, a privilege for me to work with Jeff too. We worked together many years at Yahoo and I learned a lot from him as well. So I love watching his leadership style grow and expand as well. Um, I have some funny Jeff stories for when we're not Maybe when on we're the not live. live. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have developed um, some tools and tricks for this. It is true, like when you're starting a movement, it's key to get those first people on board. But then over time, you also have to do things like maintain momentum when things get slow and how to keep people motivated when they you know, get interested in other things, et cetera. And um, one of the tools that I've used around this is uh, called, I call it the motivational pie chart, which has been called by my engineering team the most Dilberty thing they've ever heard of, because um, it's very badly named. But um, I basically give people an empty circle, and I ask them to fill out the things that make them happy at, at work. And this, this works whether you're working or whether you're in a team as part of some other organization. And People put all kinds of different things in here. I actually started this exercise because I had a woman once who said to me, if I ever do a good job, just pay me more money. She's like, I don't care about recognition or any of those things. I just like want more money. And I was first caught very off guard by that. But um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was actually pretty helpful because I wouldn't have known what she wanted unless she told me. And otherwise, I might have made the faulty assumption that she wanted what I wanted, which was actually not at all true. And so I just started asking people, what do you want? And while I heard a lot of really different things, um, I also, now I've been doing this for like 15, 20 years. So I have thousands and thousands of them. And there's three things that come up on almost everybody's pie chart. They may have different names, but they're the same three things. One is purpose. People really want to work on something they feel matters, and they want to understand how their role contributes to the purpose. Second one is growth. They want to feel like they are learning and developing and being challenged and growing, and that is true whether you're managing them at work or whether you have a team that's working on a movement. They want themselves to grow as part of it. And the third thing is connection. They want to feel close to trust and respect the people they work with. And that's also true. That's why communities are such big parts of movements. And so there's sections in there that kind of walk through some steps. And the motivational pie chart tool is also on the resources section of the website. If you want, you can pull it from there. It's called purposefulbook.com. Uh, I mean, I think you're right. Those three things. Um, a, a, sh a quick sidebar. We actually. Um, tried to get a sense. We, we had an, a, an inkling that we had a very purpose-driven employee base. And so we um, did a, had the employees take a survey. And it um, turns out that 42% of people at LinkedIn are they, they're driven by purpose as their primary motivation, not money. Um, or I think that Aaron Hurst from Imperative chunks it out into um, job, career, and calling. So it's, it's not a surprise. I think our CEO does in, in and everyone here does an incredible job of really communicating what LinkedIn's purpose is, and so we naturally um, attract the people who are oriented to that. Which is just another reason why I'm so thrilled to have Jen here with us today. Um, so um, I'm going to ask two more questions, and I'm going to open up to the mic. So as you guys start to think, if if one quick um, tip about the book, the epilogue has these amazing stories too, and in that section, um, it talks a lot. I, I think what you do is you went and asked the the storytellers what inspired them. Um, 
And actually, before you answer that, um, tell us who inspires you. Yeah, I think almost everybody I meet <laughs> inspires me. Is Maybe that's a, a cop-out answer, but it is true. Like The thing that was most surprising, as I said, about writing this book is I could get on the phone or I could talk to almost anybody and they have a story. We all have a story. And actually the, the thing that prompted me to, actually prompted me to literally write the book is I was giving this talk at a conference in London and I was trying to make the point that our work and our lives have become kind of inextricably intertwined. And I told a personal story, which was a really difficult one, about a very bad accident that my daughter had one day while I was at a work offsite, which was horrible. It was probably the worst day of my life. And I wanted to make this point because, you know, we all work with each other every day, and yet we all have these things going on in our lives that matter to us outside of work and matter a lot. And so I asked the audience this question. I had a list of like five or 10 questions I was going to ask the audience. And my goal was to get, at, get them to stand up with each question and try to make the point after you know, four or five questions that we all had these similarities. And I asked this question, I'm tempted to ask this audience, you're a little bit younger than that audience was, so it might not actually be true, but we can try it. Um, the question was, how many of you have ever received news, a phone call or other, with medical news about yourself or someone you care about while at work. Can you stand up? Yeah, that's a lot. And it was probably even more than that in the other audience because people just had lived a little bit longer. But when you look at that, like you, we look at each other, you can sit down, thank you. Um, you have this moment that just says all of us have a story. And if we understood more about each other, we could do so much more together. And so that's what inspires me, is trying to understand the story inside everybody and the movement that that can become. Uh, tell, talk more about um, why that inspiration is so important. Like, what, how, how should each of us think about um, inspiration in terms of communicating back to the person who's inspired us or or to just talk a little bit more about how that feeds into movements. Yeah, so one of the things, as Meg mentions, I, you know, after I interviewed all these people, I said to them, did, did someone or something inspire you to do this? And without fail, every single person I asked had, could answer that question. And it was almost always like, well, I saw this other person and they did this thing and it made me think I could do it too. Or, you know, some person in their family or their life had said something to them that inspired them. And then I asked, have you told that person? And again, almost without fail, nobody had. It was like 98% of people had not told the person who inspired them to do this thing. And so it just made me realize that, A, you know, the things we say and do really do have an impact on people, even though they may be small. And so it, it might make us think about being kinder to each other and saying things to cheer each other on a little bit more. And B, wouldn't it be nice if we told the people who inspired us that they did? And so there are some stories here, too, about me talking, for instance, about my parents. Um, and why they inspired me and some of the struggles they had to live through and things like that. So one potential call to action after you leave here this afternoon is just send an email to somebody who's inspired you. Um, I actually- It will mean a lot knew, to them. Yeah, I mean, when you were telling me that story, I thought I, there were three people that I'm gonna send an email to this afternoon. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna ask two quick career questions and then we're gonna open the mic. Um, so what do you wanna be when you were little? Who do you think you're going to be when you grow up? So I don't remember, actually. I have what I call the test taker's memory, which is that I remember short-term things really super well, and I don't remember my own like childhood very well. Um, but I did find, um, it's good for taking tests, uh, but I did find the other day a journal, the only journal I've ever written when I, I went on this semester abroad when I was in college to the Amazon. I, I As I said before, like I tried to convince myself that I can do scary things by trying to do things that scare me. And so I went to this country, I didn't know anyone, I didn't speak the language, and I 
I read this journal and I actually wrote something about what I thought that I would be, which is so funny. First of all, this journal is like an eight, you know, 18 year old journal. And it starts, by the way, like totally dating myself. The, the first sentence in the journal is, everything here is different except the music on my Walkman. Okay. <laughs> Which is like, I don't even know what a Walkman is. Did you, any um, Walkman? Anyone know what Walkman is? Yeah. All right, we got a few people. Um, but I apparently wrote that I thought I would either be a teacher or some kind of leadership guru is oh. what I wrote in my journal. Interesting. So yeah, you knew the word I, guru. I, and I was a teacher. So I don't know about the right. latter part, but that's what I said. And you've had a pretty extraordinary career by any measure. Um, do you have one or two pieces of advice for um, folks who are navigating their career and things that they should think about? Yeah, so I also have another exercise for this, which is also in the resources section and talked about in the book. Um, it's called the horizon conversation to help you think about the horizon and what you want to achieve and kind of help. it's about gap filling like realizing where your gaps are and thinking about how to fill them um, my advice the first one is what i call always add value like this has been my philosophy is it doesn't matter what your role is what your function is etc like be the person that is the hand raiser that sees the problems and says, I can help fix them. And that leads you to many, many other options. Um, and the other thing is, it is my own experience has been that sometimes it does make sense to not have everything go in a straight line. So I had a kind of mid-career epiphany. You were there for this because it happened at Yahoo where I was you know, I had risen up the ranks in marketing. I was like the number two marketing person at Yahoo. And then I had this moment where I was like, huh, I'm not sure I want to be a marketer. And I wanted to build products and I wanted to be a general manager. And so at the time I applied for the only general manager job that was available, which was running Yahoo Autos, um, which I loved that job, even though I didn't know that I would. Um, but it was two levels below where I already was in the organization. And they said, you can have the job, but you got to take the demotion. And so I had this moment of like, huh, do I take a two-level demotion to take this job that I might really want? And I managed to negotiate with them a one-level demotion. So we met in the middle, but I did. I took a demotion. I took less pay. I took a different title. And I think it was the single best career decision I've ever made because it put my career on a totally different path. And I also loved that job. And I got promoted back to the level where I was like 18 months later. Right. Um, one quick side note, uh, a fun thing you learn in the book is Jen's family, when she was little, um, they used acronyms all the time. So when you said always add value in my head, I went AAD. Yes. You guys do AAD? AAD. Um, but uh, no, we didn't have that one. We, this was before texting. So we had our whole list of acronyms that we like stuck onto the refrigerator. The favorite one was FHB which stood for family hold back, like when too many people came over and there wasn't like quite enough food for everybody, <laughs> FHB. Uh, and then we took these, yeah, it comes in handy if you ever need it. And the other one that was good was invented by my college friends, which is IMS, which stands for like when people call you and they want you to go out and you say IMS, which stands for in my sweats, like I'm all <laughs> in my sweats, I'm not coming out with you. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, so I am going to open it up to the microphone for questions. Hi, um, my name is Krishna, and I'm a former LinkedIn employee. Um, I have a question about entrepreneurs who want to succeed on their terms for a vision that they have. Um, it's not about investors, definitely not. Uh, so there are tons of startups out there which are successful while bootstrapping. So the challenge in the beginning for many of them who are not wealthy is how do they get off the ground? And one of the things I've been doing for like about 10 plus years is how do you, I coach them on getting to that point where they have product market fit while bootstrapping. But at some point, everybody does need help. Even I need help. The organization needs help. What are some of the sources would you recommend where I can find um, what I like to call second derivative investors? where money is the second derivative. The first derivative is the solution to the problem or the mission, because the entrepreneurs I'm working with are second derivative. You're asking how do you find secondary investors? Is that what yes. you're saying? Who, who don't invest money, but invest some other kind of resources, or who do invest It could money. be money, too, but okay. they're not necessarily looking for an ROI on the money, but um, or, or like one million invested, 
100 million return. They're looking for, it's kind of almost like a grant or a foundation grant, except these are small. Foundations are big. Yeah. It's hard to get hold of those. I mean, what I'll say is that the advice in the book, which applies whether, again, whether you're entrepreneur or activist, like it goes across, and that's why the stories cross both as well. Um, they apply here, right? And it it is about being really clear and compelling about your vision, and and not only like in words, but with stories that bring that vision to life. And it's about understanding what motivates the people who you think will try to help you, right? So if you want someone to help you, you need to understand what they care about and who are the people that motivate them. And there's a lot in there about kind of persuading decision makers, this also applies to investors. So yeah, that's what I would suggest. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Meg for hosting. And uh, thanks for your amazing words, Jennifer. This is really helpful. So I roll up through the economic graph team here and been thinking a lot about my background is in more sort of activism and grassroots organizing. So I never saw myself at somewhere like LinkedIn because I've always thought of myself as sort of an offline organizer. And the blessing of these big platforms like LinkedIn, like Facebook, is this wonderful opportunity to find and organize people online virtually. But I found also it just, uh, sometimes takes away from the offline experience and the heavy, deep work of really making social change. So you get to like it and share it and show it and, and wear the hat, but to do the actual sort of work is actually becoming an expertise. Or, you know, the Me Too movement, I think, is one good example where there was a lot of online organizing that's actually translating into women running for office, which is actually hard to do. And there's a lot of expertise around that. I'd love to, to hear some best practices or strategies that you've seen from these experts about how to move that online experience that feels good, that feels fun, that's light and easy to share, to actually translating into sort of deep, sort of social impact on the ground that people can feel. If there are ways to help transition that online experience to offline, or if you've got an offline experience back, but I think mainly from sort of the online to offline doing that real hard social impact work that we all have to do every day. Sure, so the first thing I would say is that it is probably a misconception that some, which not that you raised, but that a lot of people have that like these small online actions don't lead to other things. And we saw this at change.org. People would say like, oh, isn't this, you know, slacktivism or something? And the truth is that 47% of people who sign a petition go on to take at least one future action. They tweet a decision maker, they share with their friends, they often end up going to physical rallies or events. And so it is, I think the, the key power of the online portion is how easy it is, as you point out, to pull people in. And social organizers use something they call the ladder of engagement, where you bring people in with a lightweight action, and then you build them up to future actions. And one of the things we see happening all the time on Facebook groups is that they do, they, they're easy to kind of grow and coordinate people, but they often do end up in offline action. And last year alone, we had 22 million events that were planned and shared in Facebook groups. And so what I would suggest is that people do take advantage of the online to form the communities, but that they focus on pulling people together in the physical world. And it is, it does add that extra layer, and that's the thing that I've seen be successful across these stories. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Laura. David. Hi, Jen. Uh, thanks for the conversation today. Meg, great job uh, moderating it. Um, it seems like in the past couple years in particular, there have been some movements that I think were pure and uh, had a lot of positivity when they got started. And the uh, negative side, the uh, haters, if you will, kind of co-opted the message and it was lost somewhere along the way. <clears throat> what advice do you have to people that are those movement leaders when the when the dialogue starts to shift in a way that is maybe misconstruing the original intention? How do you get it back on track? So I'd say two things here. Um, one is that you know there's a lot about ups and downs, and there's a, an image I use that actually I recently posted in, in a piece on LinkedIn about climbing a mountain and like some days you're halfway up and it's sunny and everything looks awesome and the next day, yeah, someone like intruded on your movement and said something horrible and you're kind of at, down at the bottom of a stormy mountain. And so part of it is just like having the wherewithal to keep climbing even when it gets difficult and what often helps with that is 
having like a team of allies to support you. So the, the bigger your team and the bigger you know your supporters, the more you can combat when that happens. And I've seen it even personally. Like I, I posted recently in uh, online about something related to the book. It was a giveaway for the books, and someone made a really pretty nasty comment um, about me directly, and. There were so many people there that kind of came to my defense very quickly that it faded away like pretty much right away without me having to do it. So the first thing is like build the allies. The second thing is that I do have a firm belief that people are not born as haters or trolls and it comes, you know, it, it comes because of the fact that their lives are difficult or they've been treated badly and they lack a sense of belonging and so forth. And oftentimes they are you know, swept up by uh, groups of other haters who make them feel like they belong. And so really my belief of the way to combat this over the long term is about getting underneath that and trying to help um, build bridges of understanding. And that's a, probably a conversation for another day because it's much longer, but I, I think that there have been individual cases, for instance, where people will like get an angry tweet and instead of you know, just ignoring it or tweeting back something angry, they'll be, be nice and you know, kill with kindness or wh however you want to label it in the book, in Purposeful, I call it the bear hug, which is like treating people with an oversized dose of love and understanding instead of combating them and that can often actually bring them into the fold. Hi. Uh, my name is Daniela. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is really tall and I'm a really short person. <laughs> you know? I feel you. Um, Daniela you know, is a movement maker. <laughs> she is. Um, one are. of the things that really resonated with me is something you said about impact, that we don't always realize the impact we have. And so I guess my question for you is, um, what's the time where you didn't realize the impact you had on someone, uh, that you thought it was small, um, and someone came forward and mentioned that you did? Yeah, I mean, this, this is so nice. I do feel fortunate because I've had a number of people take the time to tell me that. And some of them come from my early career as, as a teacher. Like, I've had people come back to me and say things like, I remember you taught me about this Shakespeare character or something, and it made me think that I could, you know, it made me realize I was a good writer or whatnot. Um, and I've had other people say it about their careers. I had a very nice note from a woman the other day who said, you know, you inspired me to start my own organization doing X, Y, Z. And it does, it really means a lot because if they don't tell you, you would never know. And so, you know, in my acknowledgement section, I made a long list of all the people that I've never thanked and I've been going about trying to, to thank them over time. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Jen. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Frank, for hosting. Um, I actually wanted to build on Daniela's question a little bit um, and sort of turn it the other way around. So, um, you know, a lot, you obviously work at a company that has a big impact on lots of communities. At LinkedIn, we can do the same thing. Um, how do you approach getting people to understand what that impact would be or even just understanding that impact? Because a lot of times it's not clear, right, when you're making a product decision or or what have you. So um, how do you approach working with partners that might be in engineering, might be you know, from very, within various roles in your team, and get them to understand, or, or work with them, I guess, to understand like, what the impacts would be of making a change or yeah. that sort of thing? So again, the, the job that I have is to empower the tens of millions of community leaders who build communities on Facebook. And it's, um, it's a very inspiring job because we get to hear their stories all the time. And, you know, like Manal's story that I told earlier is just one of, you know, millions like that. And so really the thing that I try to do most is listen and tell the stories and let them tell the stories because everything we do is really in service of them. And all platforms, you know, this was true at Change, it's true at Facebook, it's true at LinkedIn, we're just empty shells until people add content to us, right? And so really at the end of the day, everything we do has to be in service of the people that are using it and what they need. And when you see what they do with it, that, that is you know, the magic, I guess. I'm gonna take advantage of my moderator status and ask one more question. Um, so it does feel like there are more movement makers now than ever before. Um, have you taken a look 
historically? And do you have a point of view on that? Yeah, it's interesting. I obviously I have not done like formal research yeah. to see to, to you know count the numbers and so forth. My guess would be that um, what we've seen is that technology is empowering right. way more regular people to do this than could before because you can, it's just a lot easier to build supporters now for things. Um, and it is, it's just true that you see more, so both it's easier to do and it's easier to spread when you do do that. So my favorite recent example is um, Emma Gonzalez and the Parkland mm -hmm. students who've just sure. done an incredible job of you know, taking what is a really, really tragic, difficult time in their lives and experience and making that you know, their movement that has brought in so many people and has already been effective. Like the fact that these teenagers have persuaded the state of Florida to change their gun laws when nothing for decades and decades has done that. And it's still, it feels like a really big mountain, right? Like to get the US to change it um, feels almost impossible, but it's not impossible. And these are the people who are gonna help us do it. We have something from the stream. We have something from the stream. Hi, Jennifer, thank you for coming. Um, and so someone asked, if someone in the audience right now has an idea that they want to get off the ground, what are the first three steps you recommend that they take? Great. Um, this is slightly self-promotional, but I will say there's also a Facebook group for Purposeful, um, which is free to join whether people read the book or not. I'm trying to start a community of people who are helping each other get these things off the ground, so I would do that. Um, but as I describe, the first most important thing is to get clarity on the vision that you have. And good visions have three steps. One is a desired future of the world. So what do you want the world to look like? And it, again, it can be small. Like I, there are people whose campaigns are about, you know, getting pregnancy parking at their office or like getting a new class, you know, offered at their school. So, but you have a desired future. What does that look like? This class is offered at my school. Um, the second part is purpose. Why does that desired future matter to you, matter to you personally? And the third part is a story that brings it to life. And this is the thing I think most people forget, and especially most business people. This is like social organizers are exceptionally good at storytelling. Uh, and so they never have a vision that is without a story about a specific individual and why it matters. And you know, I tell the pregnancy parking example, like you might say I want pregnancy parking, but it becomes a lot more visceral when you have like a photo of me when I was pregnant and I literally couldn't get out of my car. Like the cars were so close together that the door would only open so wide and my stomach was so big that I couldn't get out of my car. Like that somehow makes it more clear why you need it. Um, so. Desired future, purpose, and story. You want to do one more? Or is there a, from the audience? Okay. Hi, Jennifer. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. My name is David Petrushka, and I recently came out of the business leadership program here at LinkedIn. And today on my commute, I finished this really incredible book that I was reading that was kind of talking about Elizabeth Holmes and the Theranos scandal that's been going on in the media recently. And my question for you is, or kind of the first thing that I gleaned from the book was that the mistake happened where there was just somebody who wanted to do something really, really powerful and really, really good, and she got a little bit lost on the way. And my question for you is, do you have any tools or advices for people who are these change makers who are trying to start their movements to kind of reflect on their work and understand better their motivations to make sure they're coming from the right place? Well, this, I would go back to the concept of feedback and like being really open to the feedback from others, especially the people who are most likely to be critical of what you're doing. Because if you actively seek out feedback from people who are critics, you're likely to be more easily able to find the flaws, the potential flaws in what you're doing. Thank you. All right, I think we might have, if there's a short one from the stream. Is there a quick one on the stream? Okay, great. Um, the question is, does age matter when making a career shift or taking similar career risks? Hmm. I don't know. I think it depends. I would say generally not is my opinion, but I've also learned to know that I don't understand the details of every unique situation. So it seems a little bit hard to generalize on that question. Um, I, would, I would say, though, 
age does not matter in terms of deciding what it is that you want to get out of your career and making the hard decisions about how you want to get there. The sooner the better is probably. And it's never too late while <laughs> we're at it. Yeah. Too late, always at value. I've got all these acronyms in my head. Um, well, please join me in giving Jen a huge, warm <laughs> round of applause. She, for folks in the room, she is going to stick around to sign books if you're interested. And um, for folks on the stream and in the room, if you're interested in seeing the replay or other speaker series, please go to speakers.linkedin.com, and we'll see you at the next speaker series. Thank you so much for coming.